say it's the the best episode I've ever had, but this is going to be one of the most special episodes I ever had. If you're listening to it, this on the podcast, uh, this is episode number 88. If you don't know who I am yet, I am Bruce Outridge, and this is the Cashing on Creativity Podcast. And today we are going to talk to Tom Richmond. Now, let me tell you about how this works. I don't. If you don't know who Tom Richmond is, if you're not in the caricature illustration world, you may not know who Tom Richmond is, but you will after this. First of all, if you want to find him, just go to his website, TomRichmond.com. But anyway, Tom is an illustrator for Mad Magazine. And in fact, he's more than an illustrator. He is also a caricature artist. He's owned caricature stands, these ones you see at the theme parks. He used to have seven of them. He's down to two. He's from Minnesota. And he is one of my heroes. He's one, he's, his illustration style is the style that I try to get to. Uh, a lot and uh, his heroes are people like Mort Drucker and Jack Davis and so forth and they're my heroes too so it's nice to see you know it's nice to meet your heroes as you go so the reason we got into this interview is Tom came to Toronto he doesn't come to Toronto very often in fact he's only been here two or three times but he came to Toronto to do a workshop for us on how to do better caricatures and how to improve your drawing. And this is not a beginner's workshop. He brands it that way, but it is not a beginner's workshop, my friend. In fact, all the artists that were in that workshop were pretty accomplished. So it was a, a pretty good workshop. So he came to Toronto, signed up right away, cleared the weekend, it was a three-day workshop. And uh, one of the caveats is I said, Tom, would you be willing to do an interview with me? And his style, he said yes. He's a very humble person, and it's really nice to see. So. We, stay tuned, we're going to come back and we are going to talk to the incredibly talented, mad, Tom Richmond. All right, so we are in Toronto at the Tom Richmond Workshop. How are we doing today, Tom? Great, terrific. Great, so this is, I, I'm pumped here. I've been pumped for three days. I've been exhausted every night. You're, you're, you're working us to the bone. So you've been going around doing this. I've seen you going to Europe and throughout the States. What's the workshop series? What are you doing this year? Um, well, this is my big year of doing them, actually. Yeah. I'm doing one a month uh, okay. all over the world. Um, I'm going to be in Switzerland and London in, oh, wow. in, uh, in August and coast to coast, uh, Phoenix, and I did some L.A. ones in New York and here in Canada. Oh, wow. So it's been a whirlwind tour, but it's, it's, it's really fun. I like, love doing them. Yeah, so, I mean, people just sign up, and the nice thing about this is they're, they're small workshops, so we actually get some time to talk with you and that kind of thing. Um, how did you get to that point? Let's, I'm going to talk a little bit about your career, but I'm, I'm interested. My whole podcast is for creative entrepreneurs, so those artists. And when I wanted to be a cartoonist, uh, nobody said, here's how Charles, Charles Schultz did it. They just said, go get a real job. <laughs> so I'm interested because I think we're close in the same age. What was your, was your family supportive when you started this program? Or? Yeah, I, I was pretty lucky. You know, you hear a lot of horror stories <laughs> about dad saying, get a real job. Yeah. And, you know, why aren't you a lawyer? That's or something right. like that. But my parents were nothing but supportive. They, uh, the minute I started loving to do art, they uh, would go out and get me art supplies. And, you know, we didn't have like a lot of dough um, yeah. we, when I was growing up. So my dad built a drawing table out of an old door. Right. That he angled downstairs in the basement for me, and you know I would have these buckets full of broken crayons, and and they'd get paper from wherever they could get paper from. Yeah. So they were always very very supportive. So I was lucky that way. And did you go through a whole typical art school process where you went to art school for four years and all that kind of stuff? I did go to a school. Um, I went to a very small art school in in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is actually no longer active. Okay. But it was a fully accredited four-year college, but it was in an old mansion. And my, my graduating class was like 27 people. Oh, wow. So it was very small. And the great thing about it was that all the professors that taught there were not professional teachers. They were like working artists just teaching in their field. So I learned a lot of real-world stuff, you know, how to make a living at yeah. art. The sad thing about it was no cartooning. Oh. At, all, at school, <laughs> nothing but straight illustration, graphic design, and, oh. and that sort of thing. So, in a way, that helped me because it forced me to to learn to draw realistically, and yeah. I think that translated into my cartoon work. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, I would have loved to have had somebody teach me how to ink. You know, when I was uh, 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Well, how, okay, so going from the and that's like you say a, a power, but how did you get into characters and cartoons? Because I, when I started this, I was actually doing pen and ink landscapes. I wasn't even doing cartoons and characters. Now that's what I do. So, mm -hmm. what, how did you get into that? Well, I, uh, it was a summer job actually. Okay. I got a I got a summer job doing caricatures at uh, Six Flags Theme Park in. Um, in Minnesota or uh, in Chicago 
while I was going to college after my freshman year. And I did it every summer and I just fell in love with the art of caricature, you know, at the at that park. Worked with a lot of really talented artists and um, found my my niche. You know that yeah. just was something that resonated with me. Okay, and you you I, you're one of my inspirations, and, and it's funny how you follow that line. I mean, if you go to mine, it's Norman Rockwell, and then there's Jack Davis, more Drucker yourself. So it depends where you are in line. And uh, unfortunately, one of yours was Nick Meglin, who just passed away. Unfortunately, we found out. So I was reading. I mean, I encourage people to go to your blog and read the story because it's quite inspiring. But tell us a little bit about how that happened. Uh, well, about Nick. Nick, about Nick, not about how that's yeah. going. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nick was Nick was really instrumental in, in getting me into MAD, um, and he was very supportive of me the whole time I'd been there. Uh, but he was just a very wonderful, unique guy, and not many people really realize how important he was to MAD Magazine. Mm -hmm. He started in the mid '50s there. And a lot of what makes Mad Mad, the voice, the sensibility, the humor, was Nick. I yeah. mean, it was him. And when you met him and got to know him, you'd realize, oh my God, this is Ma this guy really is Mad Magazine. Yeah. So his his sudden passing was really a huge loss. Yeah, I uh, was reading your the blog post this morning you put out that, and one of the things really resonated with with me is that he told you to stop being Mort Drucker, whoever you. And, and, you know, that's for, for me, I, you know, maybe I got to stop being Tom Richmond, not that I am, being, but, but is that something that you found was really a change for you to kind of just do your own style? Yeah, and I never consciously tried to copy no, more, yeah. but it's, it's impossible if you're trying to do that kind of work, yeah, and yeah, yeah. he basically invented it. Yeah. So I was, at the time, I was working for Cracked, doing parodies of TV shows yeah, yeah. and movies, and I was, you know, I had all my mad spread out when I would work on a crack piece, yeah, and I'd be like, you know, how does Mort lay out a page and how does he position his figures, you know, and that type of thing. And invariably, you know, the, his, his conventions, you know, with the squiggly lines and some of the things that he would do would kind of creep into what I was doing. And Nick took me aside. I went to MAD to show them my latest piece. And uh, he took me out to lunch, he and Sam Viviano. And um, they don't do that, you know. And he <laughs> said, look, I, don't, I wouldn't take a Mort Drucker clone out to lunch. Uh, I think you've got... You're, you're in there, you just need to let yourself out and stop trying to be more and start trying to be you. Right. And so I went home and I put all my mats away and yeah. I stopped looking at them yeah. and I started just, you know, working without a net, as I would say, yeah. and just, just tried to do it on my own with just my own sensibilities. And within a couple of jobs, the Mort influence started to fade and yeah. my natural sort of stuff came into play and they responded and they gave me some jobs and, you know, I've been working the rest for a long time. The rest is history.